the Times Square Church Pulpit Series. It was recorded in the sanctuary of Times Square Church in Manhattan, New York City. Other tapes are available by writing World Challenge, P.O. Box 260, Lindell, Texas, 75771, or calling 903-963-8626. None of these messages are copyrighted, and you are welcome to make copies for free distribution to friends. I've preached on, I've given, I think, uh, 12 names of God and 12 various messages. <coughs> and the uh, manuscript is uh, coming to a, a completion. The new book is called uh, Hallowed Be Thy Names. Hallowed Be Thy Names. And I thought it was finished, but then this past week, the Lord said, I want you to add one more. This is not a particular Hebrew name, but it's, it's a name by which God chooses to be known. God himself. God himself said, this is the way I want you to know me. God is forgiveness. God is forgiveness. I want you to turn to Micah, please. Micah, the seventh chapter. Seventh chapter of Micah. For new believers, go to Matthew and turn left. About three or four. Uh, books, Malachi, and then Habakkuk, Nahum, and you'll find Micah. Chap- uh, chapter 7, verses 18, 19. Are you there? Uh, all of those in the annex, we have a good crowd in the annex also. Uh, who, who would have ever believed it? If you'd have told me when the Lord told me to come and start a church in New York City a number of years ago, right in here, that, you know, churches don't have church on Sunday night anymore. I mean, evangelicals, everybody shut it down. Everybody wants to go home and watch television. If you'd have told me then that Sunday nights would be overflow crowds, it been hard to believe. Not in New York City, that's what they said. And we are packed out on Sunday nights. And I, Sunday night's one of my favorite services, and uh, we just glad, and we welcome those too in the annex. God bless you. Uh, Micah, the seventh chapter, verses 18 and 19. Who is like, who's a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because, what? He delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion on us. What's he going to do? He will subdue our iniquities. That means mortify, kill, destroy. He should subdue our iniquities. And thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Who's a God like this? Who's a God like this? Heavenly Father, I'm asking for the Holy Ghost tonight. To come forth from my lips and from my heart and then speak to us, Lord, words of life. Lord, the enemy, the devil is accusing your people. The conscience is condemning. But we pray, Lord, tonight that you will give us a revelation, simple, clear revelation of who you are. And what you want us to know about you and your nature, who you are. Help us, Lord, to understand and discover the true meaning of God's forgiveness for his people. And, Lord, when we understand that, then we know how to forgive one another. Father, in Jesus' name, bring forth this truth. The unction, the anointing, the Holy Spirit, Lord, my words have no power. They have nothing without that unction and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, what is it that distinguishes our true God from all other little gods around the world today. He is distinguished because he's the only God who has the power to pardon. He's the forgiving God. His name is forgiveness. Who is a God like unto you who pardons iniquity? Who pardons iniquity? That is also confirmed in Nehemiah. Don't turn there. Nehemiah 9.17. Thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, 
slow to anger, and of great kindness, who forsookest them not. Now, Nehemiah is talking about the Jews, who were disobedient children of Israel. And the proper interpretation is, Thou art a God of propitiation, or a God of forgiveness, who did not forsake a disobedient people. Even though they were disobedient, God says, My name is pardon. My name is forgiveness. That's who I am. It's not just what I do, it's what I am. It's my nature. I'm merciful, but I am God who pardons. That's my name. The pardoning, the forgiving God. Oh, hallelujah. When Moses asked for revelation of his name and his glory, the Lord said, you can't see my face. No man can see my face. The Lord descended, however, in a cloud and stood before him there. And he proclaimed the name of the Lord. He proclaimed his name. Now, now what is the name that he proclaimed? This is not in what you, you won't find it in the books on the names of God, the Hebrew names of God. But this is the name that whereby God wanted the children of Israel to know him. He said, if you want to know who I am, and what I'm about, this is it. And this is the revelation he gave him in Exodus 34, 6 and 7. Listen to it. The Lord God, this is God speaking, God describing his nature, merciful and gracious, long suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, forgiving transgressions, forgiving sin. He said, Moses, you want to know my name? This is my name. This is how I describe myself, and here's how I want you to know and understand me. I'm merciful, but I am a forgiving God. That is my nature. Call me the God of pardons, the God of forgiveness of all iniquity, all transgression, all sin. Glory to God. What a revelation God gave to this man. God who forgives all iniquity, all transgression, and all sins. Psalm 86, 5 also describes his name. For the Lord, thou art good, ready to forgive, plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon him. The same Hebrew definition, again, by David. Good, ready to pardon, ready to forgive. And when David went through a very difficult time when he had sinned against the Lord. He went in the depths of depression and despair. He called it the depths. Out of the depths I cried. And David said he had a sense that God was marking his iniquities. He was keeping such a close record. He said, Lord, if you uh, regard all iniquities, he said, I have no chance. If God marks iniquities, who can stand? If you're going to keep me to the law, and that's all I have is the law that condemns me because I have failed the law in every point. And, and Lord, if you are keeping just a record of my failures, I can't make it because there had not been the revelation. The blood of Christ had not yet been shed. And so David said, if you mark iniquities, in other words, if, if you keep everything in reserve, prepared to make me face them at the judgment when I stand before the judgment, who can stand? Who has a chance? But then suddenly the Holy Spirit brought him out of the depth with a revelation of who God is. David said, if thou, Lord, should have marked iniquities, who should stand? But then listen to his proclamation. He gets a revelation. This revelation pulls him out of the depths. Suddenly his despair is gone. Folks, you talk about despair. The despair comes from thinking God is mad at you. He's got something against you because you failed. You sinned. You did something wrong. And the revelation that God gave to David. But there is forgiveness with thee, O Lord, that you might be feared. In other words, he said, I found out that you're pardoning God. You're a forgiving God. That's your nature. And I come to you because all I've seen is you marking my sins. And now I see you forgiving my sins. I see you now blotting them out because that's where the true fear of God comes from. The fear of God doesn't come from a Damocles sword hanging over your head and walking around in fear and, and despair. The fear of God is that I can serve him in peace. Because I know my sins are blotted out. Hallelujah. Discovering God's forgiveness is the, I see the only way out of the pit of despair brought by fear and guilt and condemnation. 
Now, most Christians are persuaded they know all about God's forgiveness. You know the doctrine, but very few know the experimentation, the experimental truth of it. It's not subjective. You know, you can know the doctrine of forgiveness. You can know all about the blood of Jesus. You can sing about it. You can teach about it. You can talk about how you know you're forgiven. But do you fully understand enough about forgiveness of God biblically that you can stand against the devil and you can even stand against your conscience? I'm going to bring that out in just a moment. Do you have it so that any time the devil comes in with his lies and fills you with fear and drives you into a pit and into the depths? Do you have a true Holy Ghost understanding of forgiveness? Folks, we have to have that in these last days because the temptations are going to get more, uh, going to get heavy. They're going to come with more powerful energy than any time in history. There are new exotic kinds of temptation like on the Internet and the, you know, what they call the Internet highway and, and, oh folks, I see kids sitting for 10 hours a day, I hear, sitting in front of television sitting. Don't tell me their minds aren't getting messed up with all kinds of pornography and everything else that's pouring in and it's going to get worse. Folks, we've got to know where we stand. This matter of forgiveness and repentance. Let me tell you why Christians, millions of Christians do not enjoy. They have not come into what Paul calls the blessedness of knowing that your sins are not imputed against you. That there's nothing on the calendar on the judgment day against you. There's nothing in the books against you, no matter how you feel. No matter what the devil says. Now, I want you to hear me loud and clear. There are multitudes of Christians who never have that blessedness. They go through the day with that heavy feeling because somewhere along the line in a time of temptation, they failed. They give in. And, and now they're in depression and despair and fear. It's because of a thundering conscience that thunders the law. Conscience always pronounces wrath and anger of God against the individual who sins. That is the purpose of the conscience. Now, the conscience, is, it's seared, will excuse you. But a good conscience of a good Christian who loves the Lord is going to do what it's been entrusted to do by God himself who created it. The conscience has two Mandates from God. Conscience does two things. It condemns sin and the one who does the sinning. The conscience, listen closely, has dominion in these two territories. The conscience has the dominion to give it to God to show you the deceitfulness of sin, to show you how deceitful it is, how vile it is, how God cannot... Stand it that there will be a time to give an account. Not only does he have dominion in that area to, con to condemn sin and to show the exceeding sinfulness of it and to make it as, as filthy and ugly as it is in the sight of God. He, his job is to make you see sin like God sees it. But then the conscience is, has a dominion over another area that if you have failed and sinned against God and failed the law, Failed the commandments, then condemnation is brought upon you by your own conscience. That's why people are condemned. Now, the devil doesn't condemn you. He accuses you. Now, your condemnation comes from having been accused. But the conscience, the conscience knows one thing. The conscience knows nothing about forgiveness. Nothing. If you ask your conscience to talk to you about forgiveness, that's not my work. That's not my job. The job God had given the conscience two areas for his dominion. Listen closely. If you understand this, the devil can't pin you anymore when you're free by the blood. The conscience will come to you when you sinned, and he will thunder at you. You have sinned. This is grievous. This is terror. This will send you to hell. And he's right. Under the law, do this and live. 
fail and you die. That was the law. The conscience does exactly. It won't move to the right or to the left. It's like a sentry at its post. It's told what to do. Then if somebody comes around, somebody their conscience doesn't know, this soldier standing there said, hey, the war is all over. Put your, put your armor down and, and have a good time. The, arm, uh, the conscience stands right there. Not till I hear from the captain. I don't move. This is my job. Your job, the job of your conscience is to condemn sin and condemn you for doing it. Now, the conscience in the Old Testament could not be satisfied or quieted by the blood of animals. In those sacrifices, there was a remembrance again made of sin every year. That conscience was still crying out. You are guilty. Still had dominion both to condemn sin and the sinner. Oh, but something happened, my friends. There was a sacrifice made. Jesus Christ went to the cross and the first drop of blood, the very first drop of blood and that fountain that was opened at the cross of Jesus out of Calvary came the cleansing, sanctifying blood of Jesus Christ. And the conscience lost its dominion in one of those areas. At Calvary, listen closely at Calvary. The conscience was given a stronger dominion in the one area to condemn sin. Now that I know Jesus, now that I'm under the blood, sin is more vile to me than it's ever been. I thank God for that conscience. I thank God for that Holy Ghost conscience in me that says this is sin. It's blacker than it's ever been because now you know Jesus is purity and his holiness. He is given greater authority than ever to show you the darkness of sin and condemn sin. But he can no longer condemn you. I am under the blood. The conscience doesn't want to let go. The conscience will try to keep condemning you. And that's the power. You sing about the power of the blood. There's power, power, wonder, working power in the blood. The power of the blood of Jesus Christ is to quiet the conscience and say, Conscience, this is what you've been waiting for. You're hearing now from the head. The war is over in this field. Oh, the conscience will keep trying to condemn the blood of Jesus. If you will stand on that blood. You take your conscience every time there's condemnation and guilt and some past sin is brought before you, something that you did that was grievous before the Lord, and that past sin is brought up by the devil or your conscience. There's still condemnation there. There's still guilt. You take your conscience and you speak to your conscience in the loving power of the Holy Ghost and say, Conscience. I went to the blood. I repented of that sin. It cannot be brought up to me again. Go ahead and talk about how ugly it was. Talk about how evil it is. I believe that. I've confessed that. I know how black it is. I know how evil it is. And if I ever do it again, keep showing me. Condemn me that. Condemn me in that area of sin. In other words, show me how how filthy it is. But you cannot condemn me now. There is no guilt. There is no condemnation to them that be in Christ Jesus. To walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Glory be to God. My conscience lost its dominion in this area of condemning me because I am under the blood. Oh, folks, we don't value the blood like we should. My conscience can no longer make me tremble. Can't accuse me. Can't put guilt on me. By the blood, I am forgiven. I am free. Hallelujah. Now, before I proceed any further, let me talk to you about the perverted concept of forgiveness that's in the the church today. Folks, about all you hear in many circles now, even in evangelical circles, all you hear is grace. 
All you hear is forgiveness and mercy. You hear nothing of the severity of God. And we have people today appropriating forgiveness of sin who have no desire, have no, no inner striving of the Holy Spirit about sin. They do not intend to give up their sins, but they have tried to appropriate the forgiveness of Almighty God without allowing the Holy Ghost to complete His work of conviction. They've never had that soul shaking by the living Word of God. They've not had that convicting Word of the law that says this is sin. And they have seared their conscience and they have appropriated a false peace. I have peace. The Bible said they will say, I have peace though I walk in the stubbornness of my own heart. A false peace. And God says, I'll have nothing to do with that. That's not what we're talking about. They've turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. Because I tell you, when you really understand and discover the true forgiveness of God and where there is true forgiveness, you're always going to find a love for Jesus growing and you're going to find an obedient people. They're going to obey God. And you'll find a great devotion, a great love for Jesus, an ever increasing love for Christ. If you don't have that, you don't understand forgiveness. You've appropriated something of your own mind and you've made the Lord to look like a man just like yourself. In other words, you've you've said, God is a man just like me. He's not that serious about sin. I heard heard a teacher say that one time. God's not, no big deal with God about sin. Now let's move on to the unfolding of this name, the God who forgives. Now his name was revealed in the Old Testament through animal sacrifices. Blood sacrifices had to do everything, everything to do with atonement, propitiation, atonement, which means forgiveness. That's, that's what God was teaching all through it for 4,000 years of sacrifices. God was teaching a people who one day would, would be under that banner of the Lamb of God who would come to take away. He would be not an animal sacrifice, but he would be the sacrifice, the living Son of God, the Lamb of God who would be sacrificed. But there was one sacrifice, the most solemn of all these sacrifices, the sin sacrifice, the sin offering in the Old Testament. Oh, folks, this picture now that I'm going to give you scripturally, get this in your mind. And every time the enemy tries again to bring condemnation or guilt upon you, go to the solemn assembly. It was a solemn assembly. God called all of Israel, the whole camp together, all the tribes together before the tabernacle. And in great solemnity and ceremony, two goats were led to the door where the high priest waited. One of those goats was sacrificed on the altar. But the other goat was the scapegoat. Many of you have heard about the scapegoat. And these people would bow, very solemn occasion. And and this was instituted by God. This is God explaining who he is. This is a God trying to explain what was coming, taking us into his school, teaching us about who he is and forgiveness. The high priest lays his hand on one of the goats, usually the strongest of the goats, and it was held by an able-bodied man, a fit man, the scripture calls him, an able-bodied man. Listen closely. He shall bring the live goat, and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness, and the goat shall bear upon him all the iniquities unto a land not inhabited. All right, get the picture, please. All of Israel standing before the door of the tabernacle. One goat is led into the inner court, or the outer court to be uh, a, a sacrifice. This other goat, Aaron is placing his hand on the head of that goat, and he's confessing all the sins of Israel, all the people, as he lays his hands. And in in so many words, he said, I lay all the sins of this people, all the disobedience, 
all the adultery, all the fornication. I, I lay everything on the head of this goat. The scripture says that goat, after that was prayed upon that goat, that goat was led. You can see the people parting right in the middle of the camp. Watch the people parting and looking at this solemn thing as this goat is being led out by an able-bodied man. And it gets to the outside of the camp and then over the hill and it's just about over the hill and it's about to disappear. The man and the goat is to, the Bible said, to, it's going to be taken into a land not inhabited. And that means a deep valley where there's no escape. So the goat can never come back and haunt them. And that's what the Lord said, you cast them in the sea, never to be remembered again. And as that goat goes over the hill, there would be a shout go up. There go our sins. There go our sins. Folks, Jesus was both the lamb and he was the scapegoat. Both represent Jesus. His sacrifice and the taking of sins. The Bible says all of our iniquities, the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquities of us all. God laid all of our sins on the head of his own son. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Folks, when the enemy comes at you, I want you to have your own solemn assembly. Because the Lord was saying, if you want to know me, this is the picture. Get the picture in your mind. Remember what God said about Shiloh? He said, if you want to see what happens when I take the glory, my glory from the church, go back to Shiloh and learn your lesson. And if God would send us back to Shiloh to learn about the departure of his glory, how much more would he send us back to this scene right now to give us encouragement and hope? I do this every time the devil tries to condemn me. Now, I go to that solemn assembly. I picture myself right there standing with Israel. And I watch that goat being carried away. The Lamb of God taking all my sins on him. Never to be remembered. Those sins are gone. They're forgotten. Folks, God forgets them when he forgives them. Why are you holding on to them? Why do you remember them? Lay them down. Glory to God. <clears throat> Blessed Jesus. God instituted this form of worship and for 4,000 years the animal sacrifices continued pointing to the day when he would come. I want you to go to Hebrews 9th chapter now please. Hebrews 9. I know you love the word, don't you? Ninth chapter of Hebrews. If you have King James, I want you to read along with me, please. Verses 12, 13 or 14. Read with me, please. Neither by the blood of goats and calves... But by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Your conscience has to be purged of this dominion. To the blood. Cry out. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Conscience, you can't pass the blood. You can't condemn me on this matter anymore. Glory be to Jesus. Now, secondly, God's call to repentance. First, it was animal sacrifices showing us <clears throat> that he's the God of forgiveness. Secondly, God's call to repentance itself is proof that it's forgiveness in his name. In other words, the prescription of repentance is a revelation of forgiveness. You know what I mean? Why would God ask you to repent? Do you think for a moment he would leave you at an altar wailing? Do you think for a moment he could be a just and holy God if he calls you, he prescribes to you repentance? He said, if you repent, I'll forgive. And then you repent. The very act of repentance infers or insists upon forgiveness. 
That's the proof. This is the end of side one. Why would he say repent unless he intended to forgive? This is the proof the scripture says very clearly. Now, listen now, because uh, you've got to understand this. No repentance is accepted by God if it's not accompanied by faith in his forgiveness. Now, I'm going to say something that might blow your mind a bit, but I want you to hold on. I can prove it. Many have been convicted of their sins. They've been troubled by their sins. They're sorry for committing them. They weep and they cry and they acknowledge them. They even ask for deliverance. They make confession and even restitution, but never come into forgiveness. Never. Now, folks, you've got to lay hold of this concept by the Holy Spirit. I ask him right now to make this known to you. Consider Judas. Now, first of all, there was Cain, there was Saul, there was Pharaoh, Ahab. Let's talk about Judas, for example. Look at it. The Bible says of him, he repented himself. He repented himself. Next, he cried out, I have sinned. He acknowledged that he sinned. He named his sin. He said, I have betrayed one innocent man. I am guilty of innocent blood. I am guilty of sin. I repent. He made restitution. He brought again the 30 pieces of silver, the scripture says. So why didn't he find repentance? He didn't find repentance because he believed his sin was too grievous to be forgiven. He couldn't believe that God was his forgiveness. He couldn't believe it. He couldn't accept it. And I'm saying to homosexuals, lesbians, I'm saying now to trans... Uh, sadomasochists, folks, uh, please. Please, folks. It's really... More serious than that. Transvestites, rapists, molesters. You see, the Bible says Judas went out and hung himself. Because he's saying, I have betrayed innocent blood. How could God forgive a man who's betrayed him? I've betrayed the son of the living God. There's, it's too... Ugly, it's too hopeless. And we have multitudes in the world today who have gone out and hung themselves on a tree of hopelessness. They've hung themselves. They're still living, but they've hung themselves. As far as, forget, as, far as forgiveness is concerned, they believe there's no hope for them. I say to every homosexual, even though that we condemn the sin that is there as clearly as the Bible does, I don't believe that God will give up on anybody. I don't believe. He said he's not willing that any should perish, that none should perish. None. I'm saying your condition is not hopeless. Your condition is not hopeless. You may be hopelessly involved in a... In an affair, homosexual, lesbian, or even a, a heterosexual relationship that is sinful, wicked. There's some of you sitting here now saying, Pastor David, if you only knew what I've been through. If you only knew the things I do in secret. If you only knew what I, I, how filthy my heart is. If you only knew what a blasphemous person I've been. Tell that to Paul the Apostle. Who said, I was a blasphemer, I was a persecutor, I was the cheapest of all sinners on the face of the earth. You tell that to Paul, who said, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor of the effeminate, or homosexuals, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, or thieves, or covetous, or drunkards, revilers, extortioners, shall ever enter or inherit the kingdom of God. That such were some of you. And now you are washed, you are sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of God. Church, years ago, I almost gave up on homosexuals and sadomasochists and others who are in deep perversion, or, 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 into various kinds of perversion. 
because I had a home for homosexuals that I'd started and I had uh, full of homosexuals. But the thing just it, it, it became a, a nest of iniquity. And, and it finally just the, the director of it, who was supposedly delivered, went back to homosexuality, found him in a bus station in Washington. And I had to shut it down. And I, I, I got to thinking this is hopeless. But, folks, I know I've met many now and I'm meeting more and more of homosexuals, lesbians and others who were so bound. And that's not the only thing to do is come out of the closet now. Give yourself over to it. Folks, that's Judas hanging yourself. You can't do that. It is not hopeless. It is not hopeless. There is forgiveness. And there's power of the Holy Ghost to deliver you just as it's written in this New Testament of ours. God's given me new hope. And if you're here listening to me, or anyone listen by tape, video or audio, I'm saying right now, don't. Go out and give up. That's what the devil wants you to do. Saying there's no forgiveness for you. There is forgiveness and there's healing and there's power in the blood of Jesus Christ to deliver you. Let the wicked forsake his ways. Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. He will have mercy upon him. And God will abundantly pardon you, he said. Abundantly pardon you. Glory to Jesus. The same applies to Christians who've fallen back into a grievous sin. You find yourself thinking now, this was one sin too many. I knew better. I was convicted and I still did it. I made God promises. Now I've come to wonder even if I've heard some that say, I wonder if I've committed the unpardonable sin. How can it be possible, God, to forgive me because I have done this over and over again? But hear the word of the Lord return to me. Get up. Don't wallow in that sin. Say, yes, I hate it. Conscience, thank you for still condemning the sin. And go to the blood. Run to the blood of Jesus Christ and believe that you'll find forgiveness. Unlimited forgiveness in the sight of God. And with that, every time he forgives you. Listen, if you keep running back to that after a while, it means that you have never really come to true forgiveness. Because when you come for true forgiveness and believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to deliver you from the dominion of sin... It'll produce a love in your heart for God and such a hatred for that sin that you'll never want to go back to it again. If God offers this great offer to thieves, covetous, drunkards, the effeminate, if God offers this free forgiveness, how much more is he going to offer it to you, his children who fail? It's an amazing thing that we go out in the street corner. The choirs can do this. You go out in uh, uh, is it a street meeting next Saturday, is it? Did you have it yesterday? Yesterday. How many of you preached mercy and forgiveness up there and went home and thought about something in your own life and allowed the condemnation and the guilt to almost crush you? You see, we offer the whole world grace and mercy. We fail to appropriate Scripturally, what we have learned. That's the sin of that. That's the the unbelief. Listen, you have not fully understood. You have not fully come into true repentance until you believe. Totally believe that God is forgiveness, that he will give it to you. The moment you ask for it, the moment you repent and return to him, you are forgiven. Deal with it. Enjoy it. It's the blessedness Paul's talking about. The blessedness. Uh, But Brother Dave, I'm afraid I'm going to go right back to it. And that's where the condemnation comes. That's where the guilty, even though I'm free now, 
Folks, that's the fear of the enemy. That is nothing but fear. You're, you're only to deal with one day at a time. Sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. Deal with it right now. I'm forgiven today. And the Lord who kept me this day and dealt with me, He's going to deal with me tomorrow. And He's going to keep me. And God's going to add to me everything I need. God's going to add to it. I'm not going to live in fear. Glory to Jesus. Do you know something? He offers you and me something he didn't offer the angels. The angels sinned and were never offered forgiveness. Those angels who were once righteous, obedient and holy. God spared them not, but cast them down to hell, delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. There were no terms of reconciliation for the fallen angels. There are no terms of reconciliation for those who've died. Think of all the, the, the multitude who died this past hour. Just since we've been in church, multitudes have died. Oh, do you, what do you think they would, do you think they would not jump at another chance for reconciliation? Because they know of their damnation already? But there's no terms of reconciliation for those who are already dead. There are no second chances. None. Anybody teaches that? Total error. He doesn't offer terms of reconciliation for those who committed the unpardonable sin. But to you and I, Jesus has offered terms of reconciliation for sinners and for Christians who have felt that their communion, the sweet communion of the Lord has been broken by some kind of sin that won't let go. There's terms of reconciliation given for us. He said, you, I, I want you to return to me. Now, you see, we, 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 we are in the flesh and we want to make our own terms of reconciliation when we sin or fail God. Like Naaman. Terms of reconciliation. Go wash in the Jordan and be clean. He got angry. Those were not the terms he wanted. And his, one of his associates said, look, if he'd have told you to do some great thing, you'd have done it like that. If he'd have told you to put a, a sword to your back and gnash your back and let it bleed for an hour, you'd have done it. If he told you to go out and, and uh, kill about 10,000 of your enemy and bring some skulls to him, you would have done that. You would have done any great thing. But if he tells you this simple little thing, just go and wash and you'll be clean. You won't do it. He had his own terms for his healing and cleansing. And there are a lot of us have, their, have our own terms. We won't come on his terms, his simple, uncomplicated terms. Just repent and return and believe. We won't accept those terms. No, no, no. When we sin as Christians, we, we have our own terms. Uh, I can't believe that if I just come to him because I, what I've done, and, and I've got to do penance somehow. I've got to feel the pain at least two more months. I need a river of tears. How can I be reconciled, the scripture says, to the Lord? So I bowed down before him. What about offerings, bird offerings, calves, a thousand rams, ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn child as a human sacrifice? In other words, how am I going to pay the Lord back for what I've done? I read the Bible time through times, all the way through two times this year. I'm going to pray every day for two hours. I'm going to cry and weep until God knows I'm sorry. Those are your terms. They're not his. Terms of reconciliation are this. Thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall you be saved in quietness and confidence shall be your strength. Confidence in God. Forgiveness. Confidence. I believe I'm forgiven. He said, you want my rest? You want my peace? You want it back in my favor? Quietness and confidence shall be your strength. No condemnation. No guilt. Because I have come in repentance, I've returned to him in his love. I've allowed him to embrace me. I come right now and I receive his terms of reconciliation and I am reconciled. I'm forgiven. No matter what the conscience screams, no matter what the devil screams, I am clean. (laughs) 
They that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, has not forsaken them that seek thee. You seek him, you return to him, he will not forsake you. He will reveal himself to you as the God who forgives. Basically what the Lord said, I offered you forgiveness, but you would not. And folks, some of you here tonight are going to walk out of here just as sure as anything, sticking by your own terms. His terms are so uncomplicated, so simple. Repent. Return to me. But your repentance is not accepted unless you believe in his forgiveness. His forgiveness depends on your believing it. That he is the God who forgives, the God who pardons. Heavenly Father, thank you. We sang tonight, He took my sins away. Oh God, what a joy, what a blessedness when we really believe that. Thank you for the blood. Folks, if, uh, in the annex here in this auditorium, if you're a sinner, if you don't know Jesus, or if you've been running from Jesus, you come back now to the blood. That's what he said. You return to me, and I'm going to put quietness and peace. I'm going to be back in my favor, just like that. And if you will come to my blood, I'll cleanse you. And I'll give you the Holy Ghost if you ask for it, and that Holy Ghost will give you power. That's all I'm going to say. If the Holy Ghost is talking to you, get out of your seat and come here and let me pray for you. And in the annex, you go in between the screens. Just go between. Uh, could, uh, could you go up there? At, I'll tell you what. Let's do this, Pastor. Uh, come on down here. Those that are in the annex, uh, go to the lobby up there. And the ushers, will you show the people how to come down here to this altar right here? I'll wait for you. I'm going to pray God deliver you from all condemnation, guilt, and fear. If, you, if you've been under condemnation, under guilt, you've had a hard time believing that you're forgiven. Something that's happened in your past that you just can't seem to shake. Come to the blood, the precious blood of Jesus. Now, up in the balcony, go to the stairs on either side and come down. I'm not going to prolong this. If the Holy Ghost is talking to you, you obey him now. Come and get your freedom at this altar. Don't walk out of this church tonight without total freedom. Brother Dave, I want to know when I walk out of this church tonight that I have his blood applied to my heart. And I have the full assurance of forgiveness in my heart. All of these who come to you, I bring them, I gather them together to bring them with me right now to your throne, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, you're faithful. You're not mad at anybody in this church tonight. You're not mad at anybody standing here in your presence. You've come, you said, you're not willing that any should perish. Lord, you have forgiveness and grace for everybody that's in this place. Everyone who hears this word. Oh, God, open our, open our hearts to receive it now. Look at me, folks. Very quickly, listen. I'm not going to prolong it because it's not complicated. It's very simple. He, he said it's so simple that a child can understand it and enter in. He said if we sin, God is faithful just to forgive us of our sin. If we confess our sins and repent. He said he's faithful and he's just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Will you believe now that when you repent of your sins tonight, that he's going to absolutely forgive them, subdue them? And will you picture that little goat running off with your sins? Never to be come back again. Never to be accused again. Thank God. Lift up your hands. Lift up your hands and say it with me. Jesus, I confess my sins. You know all of them. I confess them all to you. Lord, you know every single one. Take them, Lord. Put them under the blood. I come to the blood, the cleansing blood of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Holy Ghost, come into my heart. Give me power over the dominion of sin. Now, by faith in what God said, I believe I am forgiven. I'm forgiven right now. And I am clean. And I am ready to meet Jesus. Now, tell him you love him right now. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. I praise you.
He took my sins away. He took my sins away. Just a minute. Listen. I want you to sing this with me. I'm so glad he took my sins away. Don't let your conscience, don't let the devil, don't let anybody rob you of this now. Let joy flow in your heart. Let joy come. Let peace come. I'm sorry, there's nothing else in this book I can tell you to do. But believe and trust Him now for the power. Folks, if I... Must be my pride, or I'd be dancing all over this place. I am forgiven. If Jesus comes, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let's not let all the shout and be up in Harlem. Let's shout tonight in the name of the Lord. I want you to sing it from the depths of your soul, even there in the annex all over the house. Before we leave this, I'm not trying to pump something up, but folks, God wants us to rejoice in it. This is the blessedness of forgiveness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory to Jesus. Folks. Hallelujah. There's a blessedness. Glory. Glory to God. Why don't you leave tonight with the joy of the Lord in your heart. The, the blessedness of knowing that your sins are not being imputed against you anymore. Not being counted against you anymore. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Folks, do you want to really shock and mess up some minds out there? What? They're just smiling. <laughs> they say, what's wrong with you? It's Jesus. Uh, embrace. No, no mixing of the sexes, please. But hug somebody. Brother, a hug a bug. A brother, a sister, hug a sister. I love you in the Lord. Hug about ten people. I love you as you walk out. God bless you. This is the conclusion of the message.